Well, I will read in a, in a moment from 1 Peter 2, 1 to 9 as our, our scripture lesson. And if you want a moment to, to look that up for yourself, uh, that'll be our, our main reading, 1 Peter 2, verses 1 through 9. And that will be on the screen behind me as well. Let's receive this reading from God's word. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in the scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now, to you who believe this stone is precious, for you believe this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of the darkness and into his wonderful light. May God bless to understanding this reading from his word. All right, so you have to pay attention off the get-go to get this first part, okay? So a priest and a rabbit and a Baptist minister walk into a bar, all right? And the bartender asks the rabbit, well, what do you have? And the rabbit says, well, I don't know. I'm pretty sure I'm only here because of a typo. All right, all right. I tried, to, I tried to invent my own, a priest and somebody else, and somebody else walks into a bar joke for this just to try to connect to the priesthood theme here, but I, I really couldn't find anything that worked there, so I just thought I'd offer you somebody else. But, but priests are what we're, what we're into today. Not Catholic priests or Anglican priests, but us priests. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, it turns out that you are, in fact, a priest chosen by God and part of a royal priesthood. So if you ever want to have some fun when you're filling out uh, some government paperwork and you're asked what your occupation is and you feel like yours is too boring, you can just write royal priest in there and kind of see what happens with that after you put that in the box. So these last few weeks, I have been exploring some core beliefs for Christians and those that are a particular distinctiveness for Baptists in this series that's called Explain Yourself. And the idea is to understand what we're supposed to be about as followers of Jesus and how to live that out in a way that sets us apart. And so far, we've looked at the lordship of Jesus, what it means to put him first and make sure he has the last word in our lives and in the life of our church. We explored the Bible as our primary authority and the, the place we go to first and foremost for how we believe and act and some reasons that it would be trustworthy to do that. And last week, I preached on this topic of soul liberty, which actually has a fair bit of overlap with what we're talking about today and the priesthood of all believers. And that overlap comes from the Bible's teaching that all followers of Jesus possess the Holy Spirit. And so through that spirit, we have direct access to God. So they don't need a priest or a temple or a pastor or a church to act as a mediator for them. You don't have to go through somebody else or something else to get to God. You can listen and you can discern God's guidance. You can read the Bible and find in there the truth that you need. You can, you, know, you can have that on your own without somebody else having to tell you, well, this is what God says, or this is what you have to do. So there is a beautiful freedom in that. But it doesn't make Christians lone rangers either. We're part of something bigger than ourselves, and the language of priesthood can actually help us understand and find our place in that. So I want to dig in right off to our passage from the book of 1 Peter, which talks about this royal priesthood thing twice in just nine verses. 
And chapter 2 starts with a big therefore. And the biblical interpretation cliche says that if you see a therefore, it's a good idea to ask what it's there for. And in this case, it's therefore because at the end of chapter 1, there was this instruction to readers to be holy. That to say that we should live in this godly way, particularly in having a sincere love for one another. And so when chapter 2 starts, uh, it gives us some things that we would need to get rid of to accomplish that. Things that we should purge from our attitudes and from our speech. Right? So therefore, we want to rid ourselves of malice, this ill will towards one another. Deceit, right? deliberate dishonesty. Hypocrisy, which is pretending to have love or faithfulness that you do not, in fact, possess. Uh, to get rid of envy, to get rid of slander, backbiting lies toward each other. So disciples of Jesus are to rid ourselves of these things, these negative things that destroy community and instead desire pure spiritual milk in order to grow into our salvation. And this is not just an instruction for new Christians or immature believers. It is for everyone. Because the the scriptures, God's word, is what's being told as the, the, the pure spiritual milk here. God's word does not deceive. Instead, it sustains and it nourishes people spiritually. So we have one more reminder there of the importance of having some quality Bible input into our lives in whatever form we find for that. And then we get to talking about stones, but not regular old dead stones. First Peter really likes to emphasize the living nature of faith. It uses the term living hope. It calls the scripture God's living word. And here it refers to Jesus as a living stone. Living because of the resurrection. Jesus is alive, rejected by humans, but chosen by God. So as you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him. And then it goes on and says that that we are also like living stones in verse 5. So Jesus is the living stone, but we are like him because we share in the eternal life, the resurrection life that Jesus offered. And that new life begins when we have faith, when we choose to follow him. And then it awaits for this future glory that we see in Jesus' resurrection as proof to us. And the Bible says that those people who are like living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be a royal priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So we aren't stones just off on our own like the big boulders of Peggy's Cove. We are construction material. We're being built into this spiritual house, the church. But, you know, with apologies to Pink Floyd, we're not just another brick in the wall. We're, we have this sacred purpose. We are to be this, this royal priesthood thing. And I'll return to that in a few verses when our passage does. But I want to give a quick word about the rest of this passage, the whole middle section here, because it is just stuffed full of Old Testament references. And so any of the originally Jewish early Christian readers of this letter would have seen these references. They would have jumped right off the page to them. They would have immediately understood them for what they were and what they were meant to accomplish in this context. It's natural for them. In the same way that it's natural for you to understand what I mean if I say, you know, we're not in Kansas anymore or or Houston, we have a problem. You, you, You recognize that's a reference to something else and what it means. And of course, I could just really skip over all that and just say, look, these verses mean this. And that might help prevent anyone's eyes from glazing over, which I guess could be handy. But sometimes I do want to model just how studying the Bible is important, how we do that, and also how the Bible is this unified story that points to Jesus all the way through. So we're going to keep talking about stones for a minute and all the places that these these words come from. So in 1 Peter 2.6, He says, for in scripture it says, see, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. So this this one comes right out of the book of Isaiah, who was looking ahead to the Christ long, long before Jesus, awaiting this Messiah who was going to come and be this precious cornerstone. The cornerstone, which is, of course, the visible support, the strength and stability that a structure rests on. And he says, those who rest on this cornerstone on the Christ, have a solid foundation. They will never be put to shame. It's a different story for those who have no foundation because they've rejected that cornerstone. 
So in verse 2-7, next he quotes from Psalm 118, uh, which is a passage that Jesus also used to refer to himself and his life, death, and resurrection, saying, now to you who believe this stone is precious, who, uh, those words, to you who believe this stone is precious, that comma is getting me both times here. To those who you believe, uh, the, now to you who believe this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Psalm 118. And then he ties it right into the book of Isaiah again when we get to the next verse. And a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. So people, particularly the Jewish religious leaders, the Jewish authorities, those who had power in the religious system of that time, in Jesus' day, they rejected Jesus. Not because he failed to make a major impression, uh, but because he did not seem to be the sort of Messiah that they were looking for, or the kind that they wanted. Verse 8 says that they stumble because they disobey the message. See, they knew their scriptures very, very well, better than any of us, but they couldn't see that those scriptures pointed to Jesus. Or perhaps they could see, but they would not accept it because it did not fit their agenda or their ambitions. And so for them, Jesus was a stone that causes people to stumble. He was a stumbling block. And this is what happens. This is what happens to anybody. If you think that you can follow Jesus, but then not have him challenge your thinking or your comfort. Because if Jesus is Lord of your life, then he gets to call the shots. And that's enough to cause plenty of people to reject him. We want to reserve that final right to do as we please for ourselves. And so we need some reason to reject Jesus because he is a stumbling block to that desire. The religious leaders of Jesus' day rejected this stone that made them stumble. They arranged for his death and resurrection, but he became the cornerstone, the cornerstone of the church, the cornerstone of the lives of all those disciples who recognize Jesus for who he is and are willing to put him first. <clears throat> then as we get to verses 9 and 10, we continue to read that you are a chosen people. You're a royal priesthood. God's special possession or honored possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And there is yet one more Old Testament reference uh, buried in here, and it's Exodus 19.6, which says, You will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So when we go back to ancient Israel, to the Exodus, God wanted Israel to be a spiritual influence among the nations. He wanted them to stay faithful to him and receive his blessing, and the rest of the world would see how good it was going for Israel and how they were this good example to follow, except they couldn't do it. Apart from brief periods of faithfulness, they always ended up imitating the nations around them instead and fell into idolatry. So our passage here is not taking anything away from Israel's role and status, but it is taking this charge, it's taking this mission that was once given to Israel and it's applying it to the church and saying God still wants a kingdom of priests, he still wants a holy nation, he still wants an example to the world and we are it, the Jesus followers. So will we declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness and into his wonderful light or will we adopt the ways of darkness like Israel did? Now that we have received mercy and had our sins forgiven, will we continue to be faithful as the people of God or will we go back to being what we were as Israel so often did? There's a, there's a message and a challenge built into the use of that passage there. Or just to put it another way, now that we have Jesus to help, uh, help us with this new life that he gives, it's really saying, look, let's now be the people who represent God well in the world so that others will be drawn to him a royal priesthood, a holy nation, the church, and our part in it. All right, now let's, let's finally get to this question of what is a priest? What does it mean for me to be a priest? And the Old Testament priests and their assistants from the tribe of Levi, uh, they were responsible for a few important things. We're going to look back again, Old Testament, before we get to now. And a few things that they did, first of all, they facilitated worship. 
right? They, they set up and took down and carried the tabernacle, the mobile temple. They carried that Ark of the Covenant that had the, the stone tablets with the commandments in it. They tended to the temple once there was a temple. They made sure the worship space was okay, that the furniture was right, that the fires were lit. They oversaw the, the sacrifices and handled all those, those animal parts. And this was vitally important for worship. These sacrifices were how the Israelites sought forgiveness, how they expressed devotion to God, how they thanked God for his goodness and how they made reparations for wrongdoing. So the priests helped make that all possible. The priests also, they ensured the, the purity of the sanctuary because they saw God as being physically present in their physical worship space. And so they certainly didn't want his presence to leave them because they failed to respect the purity of that space. So they, they taught the purity laws that you read about in the book of Leviticus, if, which sometimes makes it hard to get through the book of Leviticus. Uh, and they administered these, and they were in charge of certain cleaning and purifying rituals. You know, you went to the priest to, to say, okay, can you look at my rash and tell me if I'm allowed to still worship, or do I have to leave the camp for a while and come back when this is better? You know, is it, is it this kind or that kind? They did all kinds of, you know, interesting things like that. They also taught the law, which is, you know, pretty important as well. They were in charge of teaching the Israelites all the decrees the Lord has given them through Moses, and they were supposed to help decide disputes as well that, uh, that certain kinds of conflicts occurred and they would use their knowledge of the law to help with that. But apart from these official duties, you have to figure that the priests were also examples to the people because they were the ones who got to go the closest to where God's presence resided. Right? That had to affect how people looked at them because they were literally closer to God than everybody else and they were more educated in the law, certainly. And so they had this role in their society, representing God to others and being, uh, you know, encouraging Israel to be faithful. And so if, they, you know, if their standards were lowered, if they failed to be good servants, good uh, you know, people who obeyed the law, good examples of who God is, then what hope was there for everybody else? So when you, if we look at these roles and responsibilities, it's not that hard to see how we might compare that to modern-day priests or pastors or ministers. People like me organize worship services, teach the Bible, try to ensure that a church or organization conducts itself in a way that's consistent with the Bible. And of course, if we need to carry furniture around or do whatever else we got to do, then we do that too. But I would prefer that you really don't show me any of your rashes. We now have a better way to manage that one, okay? But today's passage says that it's, it's not specifically gifted and trained ministers who are the priests anymore. It's everyone who has the Holy Spirit. All followers of Jesus together are made into a royal priesthood. That's important too. You're not like a priest all on your own. We are together a royal priesthood. And a holy nation commissioned to praise God and proclaim his mercies. And so this is why it is this distinctive Baptist belief called the priesthood of all believers or the priesthood of the believer, depending on which version. And so... The Canadian Baptists of Atlanta, Canada have a definition for that even, and I'll put that up here, which says that all believers share as equals in the church and in turn have a priestly role toward each other. Every member is called to be a minister. Differences in education, wealth, gender, and so on do not disqualify a person from service or from serving God through ministry to others. So the, the church that I was baptized in growing up had this list of staff on the front of their bulletin. And so you had the pastor, you had the associate pastor, the organist, the secretary, and so on. But after that, the bottom of that list, it always read ministers, all the congregation. That was their nod to the priesthood of the believer. Because there are no areas of service that only one specific person can do. Right? There's no altar that only I can approach. It doesn't have to be the pastor who leads communion or performs a baptism or leads a worship service. And some of you may not even realize the ways in which you are already performing priestly roles. Right? I don't know if you know that, but inside that piano right there is a humidifier. It has to be kept full of water uh, to keep the inside moist or the, the wood starts to, you know, it, gets, it dries out and all of a sudden that messes up the sound. You know, Terry does that. He maintains something that facilitates our worship here in the sanctuary. That is a priestly role. Running the church library as, for many years as Janice did to provide resources to help people learn the scriptures. It's priest. You know, those who lead worship for us, 
priests in our midst. When the power goes out and, you know, an outlet doesn't work somewhere around here and Matt or Allison come in and fix that for us, that is priestly in its way to our Bible study leaders. Priests, when you serve each other, when you encourage each other in faith, when you pray for each other, when you take on some task that helps your church to function in order to bless people, you are taking part in this royal priesthood that Jesus has placed you in. Now, speaking back to my church growing up, the the version of the priesthood of all believers that I feel like I kind of learned in that context was uh, the bottom line always seemed to be, okay, you're priest, so everybody has a job. Get to work now, please. That kind of seemed to be how it was summed up. Since everyone with the Spirit is gifted and qualified for service, there is no excuse. You can do something to serve your congregation, and if you're not, you should get on that. Okay, maybe that's not exactly how it was explained to me, but for whatever reason, that was kind of how I came away with the lesson at the time. That is not exactly how I would like you to come away with the lesson this time. Because I think it is more helpful to think about being part of this royal priesthood as having to do with our posture rather than our position. And by that I mean that it is not about a title or a job description or the specific thing that you do or things that you do, but rather about the attitude and the disposition that we have towards each other. Remember that therefore, which points back to the instructions to be holy, to love each other sincerely, This still very much matters in this part of the passage. To get this priest thing right, it starts with how we see each other as brothers and sisters who we are called to love and honor and serve. Because Jesus, the cornerstone that everything rests on, has brought us together as an example to the world, as this holy nation. So what do we need to do to live up to that and to help the people around us with this? How will we help love each other sincerely, to praise God joyfully, give thanks for God's mercy. This priestly posture should encourage us toward the right role or responsibility or ministry, perhaps. Churches are certainly stronger when they have members who have a sense of how they're called to minister to others, as opposed to being composed of churchgoers who kind of show up periodically, but don't have the intention or, or maybe even the understanding of how to give and how to serve others when they do. And so it is fair to remind people that being part of this priesthood as a follower of Jesus is not actually optional. There's no such thing as, well, I'm a follower of Jesus, but not a priest. No, it doesn't work that way. And so if you're hoping you're going to end up in God's care, if you're the one that you've chosen to trust, then we are fellow priests. The question is really just whether or not we're obeying God by acting that way. I mean, Jonah was still a prophet even when he was sailing in exactly the wrong direction, running from God's assignment. But refusing to fulfill that role led to some pretty serious complications in his life, we might say. And so sometimes it's a challenge because I know lots of people do not like certain things. They do not like, you know, talking in front of other people or praying out loud or being on the hook for a particular responsibility or, you know, we're often just so busy with so many things. But none of that actually changes the charge that we are priests who are qualified and called to serve, including ministries of care and prayer and encouragement, things that do not require a job description or a particular skill set or a title. So where and how we serve, that grows out of that posture of mutual love. And this is one of the reasons that we're making some adjustments to communion today, which we'll take in a minute. Because you know, during the pandemic, of course, we, we switched things up. We, we had people just kind of take one of those sometimes frustrating combo cups on the way in when they arrived and uh, just kind of use that at the appropriate time. Uh, but communion normally has a much stronger element of giving and receiving. And so we've been kind of mentioning this the last couple of weeks that we're, we're going to go back to, to having plates passed And when we pass the plates from person to person, we're actually just having the deacons pass them today. We're taking baby steps back to (laughs) where things were. But when we, in our original uh, practice, when we would pass the plates from person to person to person, that was meant to symbolize something. That was meant to symbolize our service to one another and that giving of receiving from each other. So you receive from one person, you give to the next. It's a priestly thing. You are participating in worship and service that way. 
That's also why, of course, we do that little dance up at the front right at the end where the, the plates come back to the pasture and he serves the deacons and one of them serves it to him and it's not like I couldn't just pick it up off the table right in front of me, but someone comes back over and does that, which is partially to show that there is no hierarchy, there is no favored person. Everyone serves and is served in turn. And of course, so like I said, we're still not totally back to that. The, the deacons will still go and serve today and uh, carry those, those plates around. But as we work our way back to normalcy, I think there's still a good visual reminder in this of what it means that we are priests. Because priests don't come to gathered worship simply looking to receive or simply to be served. Priests come to give too. Nobody who belongs to Jesus, who made himself a servant of all, should ever think otherwise. So the priesthood of all believers, it's an empowering bit of doctrine. It says everybody counts. Nobody is more important. Nobody is more esteemed. Nobody is left out of doing the things that matter. And so whatever time and skill and ability you lay before Jesus, he can and will use to build his church and bless this world that he loves. Because you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. God's special possession that you may declare his praises and rejoice in his mercy. So let's thank God for this gift and prepare ourselves to, to take the Lord's Supper as we pray together. Lord God, it is an amazing thing to, to know that by belonging to you, by following your son, Jesus Christ, that we are empowered with your Holy Spirit. Lord God, and from one day to another, we may not always feel it, that that is true, but your word tells us that it is, that your spirit has become part of us. And we may not even see all the ways in which that affects us, that that helps us, that that blesses us and allows us to be the followers of Jesus Christ that we are. But God, when we trust you with that, help us to, to sense the truth of that reality and to be able to live that out. And look, God, that, that includes our status as your priests, as your servants who are here to, to serve others, to help them with their worship, to help them with their walk, to help them know your word, and then to receive as well that help from them. Because none of us is too good to serve another, and none of us is too good to learn from another. Lord God, help us to be humble, as your son was humble. And so as we prepare to come before your table, I just ask that you would help us to, to reflect well, help us to prepare our hearts, and help us to recognize that this is not something we come and do for ourselves, but this is something that we come and do as part of this body, as part of your church all across this world, but also as part of the church we choose to gather with, that we would come here with sincere love for each other, and that we would just turn our hearts over to you, remembering all that you've done for us and leaving again ready to go out into this world as your royal priesthood and your holy nation, representing you well, being the example that other people need and that might draw them to you. In Jesus' name, amen.